Some of the things I look forward to in farming are constantly learning. If you stop learning, you stop moving forward. And I've been farming, this was my 19th planting season. Lots has changed in 19 years. And if, you, if I still farm the way I did 19 years ago, I wouldn't be as profitable. You know, things would be different. Would life be easier? Yeah, maybe. You know, if you just, this is what I do, life might be easier. I enjoy change. Not everybody enjoys change. I enjoy seeing new things. So I look forward to the different practices. I'm kind of a data guy. I like comparing things. I like to utilize the platform we have and create regions and do all sorts of different stuff. That's fun to me. I like seeing how what we're doing changes the soil and ultimately is it profitable and you, you can call it sustainable egg or regenerative egg or whatever you want to call it uh, it needs to be profitable what I'm seeing is by adopting the no-till the strip till the cover crops it is putting more money in my pocket so how far can we push this envelope with the strip till we run about 80 percent of a broadcast rate the nutrient removal rate, we run about 80%. Can we go lower? Can we feed our crop fewer nutrients? And how far can we push that and still be able to maintain uh, profitable levels? So that's the exciting thing to me. And I think there's all sorts of technology that can help us and trying it in the field is the ultimate test. That's the fun thing for me is pushing nitrogen rates lower instead of higher. We're at about 0.6 to 0.7 now per bushel, but can we get it even lower and still see our corn production raised? That's exciting to me to try to push the boundary. And, you know, I'm not going to do it on all my acres. We're going to let's really cut it on these parts of the fields where we have those high organic matters, where we have the potential to mineralize more nitrogen. That's kind of what drives me is I want to keep learning. I want to prove people wrong. I, I don't like it when people say it won't work. <laughs> I get a little stubborn and you know, I'll make it work. Yeah, it might not work the first year, like the no-till corn on corn. It was not a good thing, but I've learned. I've, I've created some equipment that I think will help me and, and let's progress and let's learn. But managing nutrients is a struggle with the no-till part for corn. The challenges I've experienced with the nutrient management for corn no-till has been, how do we feed that crop efficiently you know, I'm a row crop farmer, I need bushels. And that's how I market my corn, is bushels per acre. So I need to get as many bushels as I can, and how do I feed this corn crop? And talking with the University of Minnesota and poking around on the internet and just experience corn roots don't grow on the surface. So spreading my dap and my potash on the surface is not an efficient way to feed a corn crop. So I got to get that nutrient, you know, that P and K in the soil. In the first couple of years, well, 2018, that corn on corn, I, I didn't spread any because I, I didn't think it was worth it. The no-till acres had been organic for eight to 10 years before they went to this no-till cover crop. So the soil test levels are very low in some places uh, and variable. <clears throat> so some of these that are testing in the twos and threes and the, the phosphorus levels, that's not gonna grow 220 bushel corn. So how do I feed that? The winter of 2018, I put together a toolbar with some single disc openers to ban some of my dry fertilizer. Well, these only go about three inches, but uh, that's what I had and that's what I used. And uh, the, the plan was let's ban this nutrient, uh, the, our, my P and K, basically run a two by two system, two inches over, uh, but I'm gonna have to do it in two passes because I don't have them on my planter. So that was my plan in the spring of 19, unhook my strip till bar from my fertilizer cart, run out there, put my P and K in, and probably some nitrogen with it too in the spring, and then I'd plant a couple inches over. Well, 2019 was, was wet, and uh, by the time I could, I, it was dry enough to do that, it was the middle of May and I should be planting. So I decided I was gonna run six gallons of 1034 in furrow. Fortunately, the K levels on those farm are really high, like. 400s. I don't know what they used for fertilizer in their organic days, but it had a lot of K. So I was fine with the K. The P, I'm still in these single digits in places, 
in some places are in the 10, 12s, in the medium range. That's what I'm going to do. That's, that's my option. I got to plant six gallons of 1034O is right about 23 pounds of phosphorus. And uh, we put on some ATS and 32% zero by two with our planter. So I put some nitrogen on that way. I, I broadcast urea on the surface with a stabilizer and, and it got rained in for my nitrogen, 100, 145 pounds of N. The nutrient management on corn for nitrogen is pretty, pretty flexible. That's, that's not the hard part because I, you can do it in season, you can, you can do it all sorts of different ways. You've got a, a large window. It's the P and K that, that I struggle with that, that I got to get it in the soil and on these low testing soils I need more than 23 pounds. But so in 2019 come harvest what I saw was well some was planted late, some was planted in June. Um, the no-till versus the strip-till, I didn't have a yield difference. I, even on these low testing soils, we had a, a nutrient management difference because on the, on the strip-till, I'm putting on about 40 to 50 pounds of P because it's banded, so I'm running about 80% of a broadcast rate. So about 40 to 50 pounds of P on our lower testing soils is what is going strip-till, and here I had 23. Same soil types, of course they're different farms, but not a huge yield difference between the no-till and the strip-till. Some of my best corn was in my no-till field where we had adequate testing soil and then that 10-12 range for, for phosphorus and good drainage. There were some 260 bushel crop no-till corn. The fertilizer was 140 pounds of N and 23 pounds of P in furrow. That was it. So the potential I see for no-till, if we can manage our nutrients and get them in the soil for our P and K, is, is, is really pr quite good. Now, do I even need to strip till? I have been thinking I need to get a 16 row strip till bar to cover these acres. And now after seeing last year, if I can improve my drainage and if I can get my soil fertility levels up, this no-till can yield right with anything else. And using the coulter bar, spring of 19 was too wet to use it, but I used it in the fall of 19 before my no-till corn this year. I banded it, I put my P and K on, and uh, you know I, I ran a similar rate to what I would run with the strip till. In that field, I vary rate my P and my K, two products I can vary rate with my strip till or my fertilizer cart. University suggests even on high testing soil, I still should have some potassium banded. So that was like 15 or 20 pounds, not much, pretty cheap. I put it two to three inches down and then this, since it was fall applied, I planted right on that band this spring. And I still put on some in furrow phosphorus. So the wear and tear we see on our planters, especially on the no-till, you've got this soil, it's untilled, so it's maybe a little firmer, a little more solid than a loose, worked soil. So you have a little more pressure on the opening discs that wears a little more. The first year, I had just bought a new planter, it was a white with Delta Force and all of the, the hydraulic down pressure and all of that. And it came out of the factory and they run a thicker four and a half millimeter, I think, opening disc, which is great less flex, less deflection, but for some reason the engineers at Agco thought that we should have the contact point at three and a half inches. Huh. Well, that's how it was, and it was working fine in the strip till and, and whatnot, and we got into this no-till field, and I got done with that field, and I raised the planter, and all of my inner, my inner seed tube guards, or my inner scrapers, are all hanging there. That no-till soil had deflected that, and they were too tight to begin with, that it broke all the roll pins on my, that hold my inner scrapers on. That's not a no-till problem, that's a planter design because they already had them too set, too tight to begin with. So on a Sunday morning, I took it all apart and adjusted them to an inch and a half contact like it should be, which they later said, yeah, you need to adjust that. Well, thanks. Um, but 
What I've noticed is that inner scraper, as you get a little more deflection from the, the more dense soil that carries a load grate, has water infiltration that's way better, is, is a more healthy soil, does have a little more wear and tear on your planter, but I can tear apart a, and put together a planter on a Sunday morning to change inner, inner scrapers and the cost of an inner scraper is way less than the points on a field cultivator or a ripper that the, the wear and tear and the repair on a planter is so much cheaper than owning a piece of tillage equipment and just maintaining it. So, yet it, and it's cheaper to pull. Uh, so, that's, that's a trade-off I'll, I'll take any day. One of the sources that I've explored to uh, help transition to this would be our local soil and water conservation district and our local NRCS. I've had really good relationships with the staff here in town. They've been really, really helpful. One, to, to connect me with programs. Two, to talk about, you know, they, they know some other producers that do this too. Uh, I have utilized the Ag BMP financing options that the state of Minnesota has. That has been really easy purchase some of the stuff for the strip till and planters that allows it to be a, a minimum tillage planter, you know, the hydraulic down pressure and some of the cast closing wheels and things like that has gone through that Ag BMP loan program. I have done some of the independent Min middle Minnesota watershed, had some stuff, uh, some cost share for, for cover cropping, I did that and I'm water quality certified, Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program. That was really easy too because what I was doing already with variable rate nitrogen and variable rate fertilizer and the conservation tillage we already was doing, I didn't really have to change much. And that comes with up to $5,000 a year funding for added programs. I utilize those funds for cover cropping. My dad utilizes it for, he hires me to strip till his and he gets uh, reimbursed for that. So it's and we've used it for sediment control basins and things like that too. So there's all sorts of programs out there to access some funds to, you know, like I mentioned before, try a little bit here, utilize some of that cost share programs through NRCS to do that. And the people I've worked with have been really, really quite good.